Uh, hi, can you guys all hear me okay? I'm a bit too tall for this, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so, yeah, I'd just like to introduce myself. I'm Luke Bachevskis. I'm a creative director at The Sequence Group. Um, if you haven't heard of us, we're an animation visual effects company. Um, we specialise mostly in, mostly in motion graphics and uh, titles, work, advertising, that kind of thing. Um, I'll just play our reel first of all, just to give you an idea of the sort of range of work we do. Yeah, so as you can see, we've got a pretty wide range of work in there. A lot of it's uh, film titles or show titles and advertising, VFX stuff, but we're kind of a little bit unique in that we do um, a bit of games work as well. And that's um, something that, you know, we're really happy to be a part of. We're all sort of gamers in the um, office and it's, it's always been a nice thing to be able to work on. But it did kind of happen just as a natural sort of progression of um, where the company comes from. So we basically started off by doing motion comics. Um, and this was really a, an option that we did for um, the bigger film studios, so Warner Brothers, as a way of giving some narrative and backstory to some of their movies before they came out. So we did a, a few like um, way back Inception and uh, uh, sorry, I'm drawing a blank here. Um, yeah, anyway, a couple of those sort of early movies. But this sort of opened uh, our work to Microsoft and 343 brought us on to do some backstory for Halo. And we kind of continued working with them over a couple of games and um, this sort of culminated in doing work on the animated feature Fall of Reach um, that was released for the Halo 4 release. Um, so that was all original content and it was about uh, an hour's length. You can watch it on Netflix sometime if you want to. Um, this also opened the door to sort of working with smaller gaming studios, again, because we're offering, I guess, more uh, budget-friendly ways of, of showing off narrative and uh, giving um, ways to promote the game. Um, so I wanted to focus today looking at some smaller case studies uh, from smaller studios, indie studios, um, just because I think it's easier to get kind of takeaways that are applicable to everything from them. Um, so as I said before, we really like working with indie devs. Uh, it's kind of a bit different than working with uh, advertising. This is a good example of what most advertising jobs are like. Um, so you guys really kind of understand visual communication and design and have a really good understanding of the same mediums that we work in. Uh, so you understand the restraints of those as well, which is kind of hard to get across to some people sometime in different industries. So that makes it easy to work with indie devs. Um, 
It does make me wonder sometimes, though, like why trailers coming out from indie developers aren't more polished because people understand how to use the tools and create really high level games, but then sometimes the trailers look a little lacklustre sometime. Um, and the first point I kind of wanted to start on in this respect is really something that affects all industries and it's time management. Um, so looking at sort of the typical development cycle, um, this will make a bit more sense to go on. Um, but this is kind of similar to an animation cycle. We have similar thing of pre-production, production, post-production, post and then mastering, except our work generally happens over the course of, say, four weeks, five weeks on a smaller job, whereas, you know, a game could be happening over two to six years, you know, in development, depending how big the team is. Um, and this typical workflow is, is fine, but what it kind of leaves out is something that's uh, different to our work, and that's all of the marketing that comes with it. Um, you don't often see that built into a pipeline and sort of, um, you know, planned for. So if you're thinking of doing just a trailer, like the minimum you want to be doing is sort of looking at doing a release at the end of the game, and that's going to end at about at least a month of work to get a decent trailer out. But you probably want to be thinking about getting something out that's like a year beforehand at an E3 as well. And, you know, this just starts building in terms of time that you've got to put aside for that marketing. Um, if you're being more ambitious over four years, uh, you're probably thinking about getting at least three trailers out. So maybe a teaser, um, some sort of reveal, and then a release trailer. So that's effectively like three months of production on something outside of your main development. Um, and you might want to look at something like a concept trailer as well at the start. I think a really good example of this would be the Limbo concept trailer, um, developed by Arndt Jensen right at the start of production. And this was literally when the game was just a, a concept. So I believe there wasn't any real working game behind this. It was just an animation. Um, so this led to him meeting uh, Dino Patti, which they pl formed Playdead Studios and ended up making the game. But doing an early trailer can be a really good way to get you know, your ideas out there and maybe build a team or get funding that you need to make something. Um, it's pretty cool how closely the final game turned out looking at this as well. Um, so if you factor in marketing over that time, uh, what does it kind of actually look like? I found these timeline breakdowns uh, by Joseph Mirablo for the game Tower of Guns. And they're a great reference for like a one-man, two-man indie team putting a game together. So this was something where he just had a single release of trailer at the end of it um, and hadn't really planned for marketing at all. But you can kind of see along here that all of that not dev stuff is pretty constant throughout and it's taking up man hours. And while it doesn't look like a lot compared to the art and the technical work that's being done, um, it kind of begins to add up. That spike you're seeing at the end was the release trailer and all of the marketing that comes with that final release. So he very handily for me did this breakdown of hours as well. And the important point to take away from this is without planning for marketing at all or even thinking about it, um, it ended up taking about 25% of the time of whole production in man hours. So that's a quarter of the time to spend on marketing for someone that wasn't planning to do marketing at all. So it's like a large part of what you're doing, and most people aren't even factoring that into the actual production. Um, so, I mean, if we look at a hypothetical of what most people might be going through, you know, you're, you've got a game that's coming out and you're cramming, doing long hours to iron out bugs and get things out, and you know a month or two down the track you've got a trailer coming as well that you'd like to put out, which you might have really good ideas for what you want to do, but you're just running out of time. So. Do you kind of schedule time for your artists beforehand and directors trying to get a polished trailer out? Um, do you look at someone else coming in and doing the trailer for you? Or do you kind of forget about it and cram it, just hoping that the game will show itself off and that'll be enough? Um, most people, especially in small teams, will go for that third option. Um, we're usually deal well all the time dealing with number two because we're coming in as a third party and providing that service uh, for the developers. But the aim of this talk, I guess, is to look at 
some things that we've learned along the way that can help you do number one. Um, and that's kind of important. I'm just going to look at this first trailer. Uh, it was for the developer Plastic for the game Bound. And they were pretty much in this position. Um, there was an upcoming E3 and they were planning to do the trailer in-house and had really clear ideas of what they wanted to do with it. They just run out of time. Um, and Sony Santa Monica approached us to come in and just help them out to get a trailer done. I think there was sort of four weeks from when we were contacted to when the trailer was actually due. So the first thing we did was just try and get a good understanding from them about the game. Um, the brief from those guys was that it had to be really true to the in-game world. So they'd worked on a procedural system for all the animation of the levels. Um, and it was really important to them that this showed through in the trailer. Um, it had to feature the unique movement system. So you play a sort of ballet dancer um, in the game. You're not actually a ballet dancer, but the movement is ballet contemporary dance. Um, so they really wanted to show that off. And it was also really important to convey the sort of turbulent themes of the story. And also, uh, you need to feature key heroes, story elements, and need to be finished quickly. So it's a lot to include in a trailer and get across to people really quickly. So we always take these on and try and find really what is like at the heart of the game. So really the soul of it, trying to find those things that are unique about it and pushing that forward as the center of a trailer. Um, so for us in this game, the center really was the movement of the character and the world that she existed in and how that was kind of a metaphor for her internal conflict. So the narrative is about this princess character that is sort of battling uh, enemies and in this uh, unique shifting environment. And that's sort of, um, it's sort of a reflection of the internal struggle she's going through dealing with her past problems with parents and I won't give any of the game away, but yeah, there's, there's quite heavy themes within it um, that had to be shown through the visuals. So what we had to work with was another thing that we really had to take into account because of the short time that we had to do it. So we're looking at Perhaps number one, the, um, the score for the game was already completed. So we had really strong music base to work with. And we decided to use that as a, a core base to build everything around. Um, we also had a really good set of mocap from dancing and a character rig um, with the main character, obviously, in the shaders from it. Um, and then we also had game capture that had just been taken straight, straight from you know, the game engine. Um, so we wanted to kind of show off the game capture, but we felt that to really show off the dancing in the environment, that we wanted to take it out of the game engine. We brought it into Maya and took the mocap and just created different camera angles on it as a way to show these off in a more interesting way. Um, we also wanted to have the idea of a kind of dark area that would be sort of broken through as the movement progressed. Um, and this was sort of going to be a, a, a metaphor for her sort of discovering the secrets that you discover in the game. Um, but we also want to have a really turbulent feel as well towards the end of it. So I'll just show you the initial animatic that we made for these guys.
So yeah, it's a mix of game capture and then a lot of stuff that we rebuilt in Maya. Um, Plastic really liked this as a start. There was a few notes that were kind of really interesting to us just because we didn't have that um, close association with the game. So with, there were things like uh, some of the movements um, of the princess in it kind of appearing too sexy once we'd got those camera angles on them. Um, and this was really important for them, for that character not to be portrayed that way. Um, and it's something that we weren't intentionally trying to do, but coming from the developer that was so close to the game, it, it, was, it was great to have their sort of insight to bring us back a bit on that side of things. Um, also, there was a lot of stuff that was happening in the environment around that just didn't happen with the procedural animation. So we had to spend quite a bit of time trying to match that really closely to what um, had been programmed into the game. And this was actually one of the hardest things with this trailer. We had planned to use the ribbon elements a lot through this, and we just couldn't get dynamics in that time working in the same way. We could get really beautiful looking ribbons, but um, it just didn't match close enough to what actually happened in Game Engine. Um, so we also uh, worked on the shader development. We wanted to try and find a good mix between the way it looked in the game and something that was more polished. Um, and with compositing, trying to find a fine line between, you know, again, some level of post-processing effects on it that didn't steer too far away from the game itself. Um, so I'll show you guys the final thing. Oh, one, one other thing happened in production. The time that was allotted for the trailer cut from 1.30 to 45 seconds. So it actually sort of cut the trailer in half, which happened really late in the day. And it was a bit of a shame, but... Um, yeah, I'll play you the final thing. So I guess the thing that I wanted to point out with this is that nothing we really did in this was something that couldn't have been handled by Plastic in-house. Um, there are a lot of issues that we faced just coming in as a third party and trying to replicate things that were already present in game that if it was made in-house wouldn't have been a problem. But it was purely just that issue of time management and not allocating time for that crunch period at the end to, to make something happen. Um, but it's cool they still went to the path of trying to bring somebody in to get that to a, a level that they were happy with. Um, it brings me to the point of like, is it all worth it? Um, when you're sort of working so hard and you've got a limited budget, is it worth the time and money to do that? Um, you might already have a huge social following, uh, have development posts, Instagram followings, be doing talks and all the other sort of marketing that's happening, but uh, why would you want to do a trailer? Um, there's a reason though AAAs are spending, you know, up to a million dollars a minute to make high level trailers. And it's really that, you know, it's your first prepared presentation to an unknown number of people where you're showing off your game in its entirety, a, a message that you want to send about it in the space of sort of two minutes. So you've got to kind of imagine you're taking the game and you're putting it in the middle of the MCG or something, and you've got to actually walk away from it and let the game speak for itself. So making sure the message that it says is the right message is really important. Um, I think people often think of it as being sort of a start of a conversation that's happening, but really if the trailer's not right, it can be the end of a conversation with a lot of potential players. So you want to make sure that first meeting with them is a way to continue the conversation and let people know more about the game. Um, so those first impressions definitely last. Uh, this can be tricky sometimes to sort of step away from your game and kind of put yourself in a headspace where you can really nail things down to a central core or what the heart of the game is. And the next thing I want to look at is a trailer we did for um, Jason Roberts and his game Goragoa, which hasn't actually released yet, but should be this year sometime, I think. 
Um, so it's a visual puzzle game and it kind of explores themes of spirituality and religion. And um, basically we were brought in again because of time constraints that Jason was facing, but also the fact that he was so deeply invested in this game that it was proving to be quite difficult for him to step away from it and, and put something together that really summed up what the game was in that short amount of time. Um, he was struggling with the fact that he didn't want it to show a lot of spoilers. Um, it's a visual puzzle game, so just by the fact you're showing the game, you're really giving away a lot of the mechanics of the game and how to figure things out. Um, so we decided to try and find a different angle towards it and how to develop it. Um, so I'll just play the first animatic that we sent through and just sort of explain some things while it plays in the background. Uh, Jason provided us with about 12 gigabytes of just artwork that he was using from the game, which is a, it's great that it was a, you know, a, a difficult starting point. Um, but the more we talked to him about this, we, we were just sort of blown away by the development of this game. Um, he'd been working over it, on it for up to about six years at this point, and we learned that all of the illustrations in it were done by hand on paper and then scanned. Um, and one of the craziest things was it had taken this long because as he was developing the game, his, uh, his ability to draw had become so much better that he actually wanted to go back and revisit a lot of the initial scenes that he's drawn just to make it, you know, bring it up to the same level. So um, as we were kind of learning this, we, we sort of felt that the heart of the game was almost this labor of love, you know, it was the craft behind making it. And so you're seeing in this animatic, we wanted to obviously show off a lot of the artwork, but try and start to build a bit of a handmade feel to it. And to begin, we had this quite literal thing of a hand drawing on the images. Um, as things went along, we fought, felt this was a little bit naff and you know, it didn't quite fit the aesthetic. So we got rid of the hand. It also opened up the ability for us to take all of these scans and actually build them simultaneously. So everything was drawing kind of as once. So we took the scans and just did clean up conversions into Illustrator, used them in After Effects to sort of reveal the images, and then really worked on giving it a handmade feel. So we uh, introduced, uh, introduced sorry, some page textures and had a feel of sort of reflective pencil marks, um, added some 3D camera movements and depth of field to this. And um, some of the animations were frame by frame, so we wanted to kind of show that off as well. So we kind of employed uh, zoetrope effects where you, you know, place each frame down and then the camera moves across it at the same frame rate. Um, yeah, and I'll show you the final result of that. So we managed to do that trailer with only sort of two reveals. I think both of those puzzles featured were in the demo as well. So um, it's pretty important that to show how the game works, but we definitely wanted to show the kind of process as much as that as well. So, I mean, that can be a kind of important takeaway as well. I, if you've been working on something for a long time and there's something really unique in the process, could be in, you know, the coding or mechanics of the game, the script or the sound, 
like you can use that as a central focus of a trailer to really get interest in, in the game. Finding something that's unique like that is really important. And it's also key to try and get your head out of the game. If you've been working on it for that long, maybe even come back to your original concepts and really try and find something that is, is central to it that you can show off. You don't need to explain everything in a trailer in one go, um, especially with big titles that pop up showing all the features. Because, I mean, that's what everybody defaults to and it won't really stand out if you're doing that. Um, so the next thing I want to show you guys was a case where we were developing a trailer for a game that was like really early in, in production. So uh, Giant Sparrow was developing a game What Remains of Edith Finch, which is final, its final name. It was The Nightmares of Edith Finch to begin with. And they again had a presentation that was coming up and needed a teaser trailer for it. Um, the problem with it was that there was very little assets that were kind of visually usable. So this is a big difference between when we do any trailers or titles for films versus games. Um, when you're looking at a trailer for a film, you might be dealing with a shot that's half finished, but you're only dealing with that shot. The scene that you've got to composite in around it is literally for that frame range and you can work on that shot and develop that shot to a finished state. But when you're looking at a shot from a game, you might have to develop the textures and assets that happen across a whole level just to fill up that certain scene. So it's, it's something that's not really viable in production sometimes to just fill out a scene with uh, something just for one shot in a trailer. Um, so these are kind of some of the game captures that we were given around the time that we're asked to develop the trailer. And as you can see, they're, they're really sort of range from blockouts to uh, parts of the game that things like type and font were just placed in for placeholders. And a lot of things were buggy and not loading properly. We weren't actually able to get a working version of the game to um, use ourselves. So there was, there was a bunch of footage, but none of it was really to that level that you want to show off by itself. Um, we worked on a couple of different concepts. That one's a little tricky to see, sorry. Um, one was based around the idea of uh, the family tree, which is something that is, is really central to the narrative of this game. And we wanted it to be a mix between concept art and some of the footage from the game. Um, the second pitch we had was taking some of this footage and really melding it together um, creating little collages of like the images overlaid over the, each other. And this was to really push the idea of mood in the game. It's a very sort of uh, mysterious, dark game. And that was one of the themes in the brief they really wanted to push across. So this was sort of a way of merging stuff together and kind of hiding the assets a bit, but getting the mood across. Uh, the third option we were looking at was using the existing concept art that was there, which was all really beautiful and is often a good way to deal with an early trailer um, because you, you have those really nice looking assets that you can use early on. But we didn't feel it portray the game in a sort of accurate way for the final sort of product. We didn't want people to think this was going to be a hand-drawn kind of game just because we knew we were going to be sort of mysterious and tease things out of this trailer. Um, we also did a pitch that was m more based on an editing technique so there was the ideas of death and renewal, and we wanted to play with the way small clips were cut together, that they would loop, and that the audio that we captured from the actual clips would build up the soundtrack as it went. Um, so this was more a bit of a conceptual kind of idea. It's probably going to be really soft, these speakers are low for some reason. So you can barely hear it, but um, yeah, all of the audio from these clips is just from the in-game audio and we sort of built a bit of a track from it. So we presented all these ideas um, to Giant Sparrow and they kind of liked all of them, but wanted to take bits and pieces of different one and bring it together. Um, so we looked at sort of, at first, building a few of these like little 
kind of collages of the different bits of game capture over the top of each other. And um, from there, we wanted to get a really rhythmic sort of edit happening that would kind of feel a bit entrancing. So again, we employed music really early on to create that, um, that sort of base to work off and used a track by a guy called Lost School. And um, the developer liked that so much that we ended up using it for the final trailer. But I'll just show you guys the final thing. Hopefully it's a bit louder. <laughs> I hadn't been back since the funeral. Nothing had changed. Everything was just older. Looking back, I think that was the first really bad sign. A lot of this isn't going to make sense, and I'm sorry about that. I'm just going to start at the beginning with the house. So yeah, this... PlayStation. Oh, that bit always gets me. Um, yeah, so it's quite dark on this screen, but I mean, the, the theme of the trailer was to be sort of dark and moody and mysterious. Um, we got a lot of YouTube kind of comments about the final lines being a lot of, this isn't going to make sense and I'm sorry for that. And that was, people found that quite funny because it didn't really make any sense. But, um, anyway, uh, Giant Sparrow really liked it. Um, and six months later, they had another presentation to do at E3. The assets had kind of moved along a bit, been more developed. We actually had the house as an asset, which was good. None of it was textured, but it was something that we could use. Um, we thought it was a really key central character in, in the game. You, you unlock parts of this house that then unlock the narratives. So we wanted to use it in some way. Um, and we came up with the idea of having the game capture sort of projected onto the surfaces of the house. And because we didn't have full textures for them, we would just leave the textures off and use it as a bit of a canvas to kind of show the game capture on. And it had kind of the benefit of hiding both from each other a bit, you know, you're covering one with the other and um, so it was a bit of a win-win with that. So this is the final trailer for that one. A lot of stories people tell about the Finch family. Most of them end strangely. Some of them don't even seem possible. And they can't all be true, obviously. But the Finch family stories I believe, the ones that seem real to me, those are always the ones where somebody dies at the end. I'm not sure if the story I'm about to tell you is true or not. But I know it's something nobody's heard before. This one is mine. Yeah, so that was when the game was still really in early alpha and um, it, it helped to build a lot of sort of intrigue about the game and give those guys an avenue to talk about it more. Um, the final game actually looks amazing. Like, the, the world itself they've created is just beautiful to walk around in. If you guys haven't played it, um, I'd play it just for that. Visually, it's, it's great. Um, all of the games I've been talking about, though, are kind of things that, like, are quite visual in their nature. So what about games that aren't sort of focused around a strong narrative or things that visually come across in an easy way. 
things like strategy games or puzzle games that maybe don't use visual mechanics as a way to drive the game. Um, so I'm going to look at just a couple of tra well, a trailer we did for Relic. We'd done a couple of trailers for them for Company of Heroes 2, um, one for their uh, Den's Assault expansion. And um, Relic really puts a lot of effort into, with each release, just having a, a lot of marketing content behind it. And obviously, they're backed by Sega that wants to, you know, make that happen. Um, but, yeah, they, they wanted to go with something that would, uh, you know, expand on what we'd done for Ardennes Assault. So in Ardennes Assault, they'd introduced a new uh, map element that hadn't been in the games before, and it... Uh, allowed you to have non-linear gameplay so you could choose which missions you want to take next and that would affect what mission happened afterwards. Um, and we'd done this through like a, a sort of motion graphics style that then blended with gameplay that we'd sort of treated and worked with the in-game cutscene directors there to do the two together. But uh, they had a unit expansion coming up which was for the British forces and um, they wanted to do something that wasn't just going to be gameplay, that wasn't going to just be, here are the units from top down, you know, fighting other units. Uh, so we kind of had to go into it thinking a bit about our core audience and what would appeal to them that wasn't just showing off the game. Um, so who was that target audience? So we're kind of looking at people who are generally into history, um, into the strategy genre as a whole and maybe even people that are into sort of tabletop gaming and stuff that happens away from a computer. Uh, so our early pitching, we were trying to appeal to visual styles that represented that. So on the top, we went for this sort of painterly look, the way we would treat the new units, but in a painterly World War II style and transition through these in a sort of motion comics way. Uh, the second was more looking at a tabletop uh, model making kind of feel mixed in with a sort of um, propaganda kind of text that we used as a graphic element over the top. Um, we also thought it was really important to have some sort of narrative behind this. And a way of doing that was like appealing to the history buffs and looking at, you know, what the British forces did during World War II. So we searched around for some like uh, inspirational speeches that maybe some generals had given. And there was the obvious Churchill one, which we ended up using at the start of this, but we thought it had been done a million times. And we wanted to get the feel of like a commander on the ground giving, giving orders. So we went with uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, but we found out that there was like very little of him that had actually been recorded and all the speeches were kind of boring. So we kind of went through and like chopped up a bunch of speeches and pasted them together in a bit more of an epic speech that sort of um, matched what he might give for the invasion after D-Day. And then went out and found a voice actor that could do the Montgomery voice in a convincing way. And this was actually really difficult because we knew history people were going to really take this and, you know, pull it apart. If it didn't sound right or if we were using parts that perhaps weren't um, from any speech at all or just completely made up, that they would pick it out and probably be offended by it. Um, so knowing your audience like that is, is important and making sure that you... Uh, what you're doing is living up to standards that they would enjoy. Um, so the final trailer was sort of a mix of the, the second and a little bit of elements from the first. But the important thing to note here is there's like no game capture at all in this. It was all motion graphics. So it was a way of portraying this without showing the game at all. We shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Greetings men of the combined British forces, Field Marshal Montgomery here. To us is given the honour of striking a blow for freedom, which will live in history. We will 
stand and fight here. If we can't stay here alive, then let us stay here dead. With stout hearts and with enthusiasm for the contest, let us go forward to victory. My business, as you know, is fighting. Fighting the Germans. Oh, and anybody else too who wants to have a fight. Good luck to each one of you. And good hunting on the mainland of Europe. Yeah, so that trailer was received really, really well by the existing sort of player base. Um, and um, it, was, it was a fun one to work on because we were just getting some of those assets and treating them in a way that was very kind of heavily stylized. Um, I guess my last point is to, if you're thinking about doing a trailer in-house, is like play to your strengths. Like really have a look at who's in your team and, and what their skills are and how that would translate into your marketing. And this doesn't have to be trailers, it could just be anything really. Um, so what I find interesting about uh, game development studios is that you guys are really like at the forefront of a lot of technologies that um, other industries are trying to get, you know, a tap into. So, um, just having the interactivity of certain things is, is a big plus, like understanding how that all works and how you can get that out there in a, in a way that looks nice. Um, so I don't think you have to think of marketing just in the traditional linear form. Um, one of my favourite sort of teaser trailers recently was the Silent Hill playable trailer, um, which was, I think, directed as well by um, Guillermo del Toro. Um, <laughs> his uh, like favorite film director of mine, but that, that was just like such a fun sort of thing to do and really was kind of a game in itself. Um, also, Oat Studio, which is run by Neil Blumenkamp, who uh, directed District 9 in Chappie, has been really investing recently in using Unity as a way to um, put short films out there. Um, and it really is the trend of our sort of field at the moment, using a lot of game technology to help build visual effects in films. So you guys have all of that already, you know, at your fingertips. And I think it's important to know that uh, you should be using that in a creative way to get what you're doing out there. Um, and it's really possible to do just traditional, really cool trailers in-house as well. Two trailers that, um, or companies that I really like the work that are doing that are all in-house. There's local League of Geeks that every one of their um, Armello releases has just amazing um, cell animation in it. And I believe that's all done in-house. It's, it's really like pretty trailers to look at. And one just recently from E3, The Last Night by Odd Tales, which is yet to be released. But uh, I couldn't believe this was all like in-game footage or, or yeah, seems to be anyway. Um, yeah, it's, it's really a beautiful look. So these guys are definitely playing to the strengths that they've got visually in terms of um, what's in the company. But, you know, there's no reason why teams shouldn't be able to create cool stuff in-house if you just give yourself time. So I guess my key takeaways would be try and find the heart and soul of your game and really show that off, that you'll get time in the future to uh, tell people more about your game and explain the intricacies of it, but finding that really central point is, is important. Um, giving yourself that time to do it, or at least understanding that you won't have enough time to get it done and finding some people that could help you, whether it's animation studios or it's even like talented people like directors or musicians or, you know, performers that can do some things with you to make your game really stand out. Um, and I guess to know what your strengths are and, and really try and play to them. Um, yeah, so thanks guys. And if you have any questions... Yep. Uh, hi. So, 
Yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of our services, we do things like, uh, in terms of advertising agencies, they'll come up with a, a core creative and then they'll come to us to expand that creative, um, create storyboards, really base level stuff, and then hand it back to them. So not all the time are companies like us trying to do the whole thing. We often will come in as a sort of consulting role or just helping out in certain parts. And there's also, especially in Melbourne, a ton of really talented freelancers that, um, you know, are kind of directors, creators themselves that you could get in just on a one person basis to maybe join the team for that short period of time and work in house. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I, I guess that's just connections through doing other sort of work. So it was going through a sound studio that we work for a lot of um, advertising jobs and they usually, you can give them a, a, a voice and say, hey, do you know anyone that sort of would match this or is able to kind of get that level and they'll usually pull together three or four people. So if you found sort of a sound production studio, they'd usually be, you know, willing to do that for you just at up front just to give you, hey, here's a few options. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, what um, tools and methods would you recommend for getting the highest quality in-game video capture? Um, we use really basic tools, like we're using the NVIDIA captures, just screen capture from it. Um, so with Edith Finch, we got a build of the game and we were able to get a free camera that could just move around and we were just using controller and capturing that way. And like you can, if you're running at 4K or something, you can still get, you know, the highest resolution that you've got there. It's just, you probably noticed there was a lot of like in that one, especially like frame dropout in it, and it's just the game wasn't optimized at all at that point. So there was nothing we could really do. Yeah. Uh, yep. The back. Yeah. How much we have to kind of say, you know, we have to wait until um, we get some more there Yeah, I think generally any part that's sort of past that early concept stage, there'll be something doable. I mean, usually you've got a concept artist that's worked out a look of the game or at least some, some visual representations of it. And just talking to developers, they'll have a clear idea of what they want their game to be. So. Um, say with Bound, the assets that we got were, you know, fairly far along, but at the same time we were sort of thinking about rebuilding the princess as a new up model just because it, there was some bending and stuff that was happening in a lot of the joints um, that, that weren't great. But um, I, I think at any stage it's, it's more like nailing that creative early on and just finding a creative way to show what you want to show with what you've got, like there's always solutions for that kind of stuff. Um, anybody else? Yep. How did you initially did you get the contacts for the job? Uh, so Sony Santa Monica, one of the people working there had previously worked at 343 and so we'd known him through working on the Halo jobs and that opened up a lot of their work and he's since moved on to Annapurna um, which then has opened up work through those guys. So, I mean, it's just like anything else, building good client relationships and then work opens up from that. Um, yep. Um, when, if you're approaching an advertising company to build your trailer, what would you say a good amount of work to give them to work with is? Is there too much to middle? Or do you sort of base on the dialogue with them how much they would need? 
Yeah, so I wouldn't go straight to an advertising agency because they'll typically like charge you a ton and then get some other people to work on it um, for the creative. But I would try and just come up with the creative in your own head of those things of like what you want to show for the game. Like if you've got a few core concepts like that, most people will look at the assets that are available and try and work something out from there. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, definitely. And like it, there was something that I wanted to kind of show in this talk, but just didn't have enough time to cover. It's just that that side of making sure that what you're showing is is being truthful about what's achievable. Um, there's been some real horror stories, not just in trailers, but developers saying that a game's going to be able to do something, and when it can't, it's like the worst possible pushback that you can get, really. So, um, a famous one I can remember is the. Um, Project Milo or something. Do you guys remember that at all? It was like for the Natal. It was like, yeah, pretty crazy. Just showing off software that was just ne never going to be existing at that point. And they were blatantly saying that it existed at that point. And I just don't, yeah, it's not a smart move to do that. So it's definitely, I guess, having a conversation with the developers and making sure that we're doing stuff that, you know, they're comfortable with showing. But really it comes down to what the developer wants to show in the end. Yeah. Ah, I think we're done. All right, thanks, guys. Thank